Um, so today's message is called, Are You Ready? So church, I want to ask you this question, are you ready? You're supposed to say yes. Yes, okay, thank you, great, that worked very well. And so, thank you. So uh, today's message title again is, is Are You Ready? And we're going to be uh, in the book uh, of 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. So if you want to go ahead and turn there, if you want to turn to the Bible app, uh, the, the scriptures will be on there. We'll be in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. So I have three objectives today that I want everybody to get out of today's message. And these are th three objectives are, the first one is a call to ministry or missions. The second one is is a call to share your life and serve your brothers and sisters in Christ. And the last one is a call to salvation. And so within the, I'm, I'm gonna be asking you, are you ready, dot, dot, dot. Now you don't have to answer, but in your mind you can answer that question, right, by yourself. But in those, as I ask those questions, these three objectives should become aware to you. So if you want to write those down again, one of them is a call to ministry or missions. The second one is a call to share your life and serve your brothers and sisters in Christ. And then the last one is a call to salvation. So let's begin in God's word, right? First Thessalonians chapter two. So Paul wrote this letter to the church of Thessalonica as he was on his uh, missionary journey going preaching to different churches. So whenever you see uh, different churches there and you read that I, Paul, uh, your, brother, your brother in Christ, and writing this. So that is Paul writing this letter um, because a lot of the times Paul was on this journey and a lot, of the times he, a lot of time he spent in prison as he was writing these letters and he had disciples visiting him and he was handing these letters off and they were going to give these letters to different churches. And so Thessalonica was one of those churches. And so here Paul writes, for you yourselves know, brothers, that our coming to you was not in vain. But though we had already suffered and been shamefully treated at Philippi, as you know, we had boldness in our God to declare to you the gospel of God in the midst of much conflict. So going back to verse 1 where it says, For you know, brothers, that our coming to you was not in vain. So Paul right here begins by reminding the church of Thessalonica that their visit to them was not in vain, or in some translation it says without result, meaning that it was a successful trip to Thessalonica. And so you may be asking, what made it a successful trip? What was it that they went and uh, there was something that happened? And so we'll read throughout this text. Now the second part of this verse where it says, but though we had already suffered and been shamefully treated at Philippi, as you know, we had boldness in our God to declare to you the gospel of God in the midst of much conflict. Now I want to focus in on the part where it says um, that Paul suffered and he had been shamefully treated. So as I mentioned earlier, Paul was a missionary. So before Paul was a missionary, he was killing Christians. That's what he was doing. He was the head of the, the, the Pharisees, and he was murdering Christians. And then one day on the road to Damascus, Jesus met him, and he converted into Christianity. And from there, Paul started his journey. And as he began his journey, he began to gain traction and hate because of the work that he was doing. He was, there was Christians being converted left and right, thousands of Christians, thousands of church, churches being built, and people wanted his head. And so when we read that first part of that verse where it says he was shamefully treated, we have to understand that Paul had undergone physical hardship and had been shamefully treated verbally. So Paul was in prison, right? And if you go back and read what prison was like back then, it's, it's nothing compared to what it is today, right? There was no AC. There was no, uh, you know, I, I'm sure they probably got no meals. I'm sure he was brutally treated. There was people in there who treated him, and, and we know that by the verse telling us. And one commentary says this about Paul. It says, it was the way that Paul lived and moved in God that no hardship and no opposition was able to take away Paul's confidence and his courage. So although Paul had been shamefully treated and verbally treated, uh, shamefully treated and verbally treated, uh, uh, shamefully verbally treated, sorry, that doesn't even make sense, but yeah, you get it. He still managed to have the courage to go share the gospel. See, and some of us, even including myself, a person cuts us off on the road, and guess what? We turn into a whole different person. 
right? Amen? Amen. Yeah, okay, I, I knew, yeah, I mean, road rage is just crazy these days. I mean, you see, uh, that's like on the news every day. It's, it's really sad, but it happens, right? We, we change somebody, does something to us, and we automatically make them become our enemy, or we don't like the way that they stared at us, or we don't like the way that they looked at us in the morning when we walked into the, to the office, whatever that may be. But Paul, aside from that, right, aside from, from tr- being treated harshly, he still went to share the gospel. And see, the first time I read this verse, verse 2, where it says that, uh, that he shared the gospel in the midst of conflict, I wrote this down in my Bible. I put, when was the last time that I had the boldness to share the gospel in the midst of conflict? And so, church, I ask you that this morning. When was the last time you shared the gospel in the midst of conflict? Meaning, when was the last time you shared the gospel with somebody that you didn't want to share the gospel with? Somebody that you consider an enemy or somebody that you don't consider a friend or somebody that you have been trying for years and years to share the gospel with and they've rejected you time and time again. See, I know it's not easy to try and share the gospel with someone because there have been plenty of times that I have tried to share the gospel. And many times when I know God was leading me to share with a family member or a coworker or even somebody random, most times I didn't even mention anything about God or I just completely blew it off. In fact, this week, right, as I was preparing for this message, I was like, God, I'm gonna share the gospel with somebody. And so I got an Uber ride uh, so our, our car had to go, you know, it was that time for the oil, you know, we're about 1,000 over uh, for our oil change. Um, and if you know, yeah, if you're there, yeah, if you're one of those people that get it right on time, God bless you, and, you know. But we were like, our, our thing kept reminding us every day, you're already over, you're already over, and we just ignored it. So finally, we went to go get this oil change, and thankfully, uh, they provide an Uber ride if you live within 12 miles, so you can leave your car there. You don't have to wait there in the little waiting area, but you get to go home, and so, uh, you know, my wife, Alondra, took the car. She came back. She went to work, and so then later on in the day, I went to go get the car, and so when this Uber ride came to pick me up, I was like, God, okay, this is, this is the time I'm going to share the gospel with this person. I don't know how, but I am. God, I know I'm preparing for this message, and, and I have to do it, and so I get in the car, and this guy's name was Paul, right? It's kind of weird. His name was Paul, like the Paul the disciple, and I'm talking to him, and, you know, we're making conversation, and I'm asking him how long you've been doing this. I'm sure he gets that question all the time because, I, you know, Uber driver's like, hey, how long have you been Ubering? Oh, you know, and so then the conversation goes along there, and then, you know, we start talking about family, just about things that are happening, and then we're getting close to the destination. I'm like, all right, God, I haven't even mentioned anything about God, and so I'm like, hey, Paul, you know, is there anything, you know, I could pray for you, or is there anything I could pray for you? Oh, no, man, I'm, I'm blessed, bro. Like, there, there, there's nothing. Like, I, I'm good. You know, I'm good. I, there, there's nothing I could, I don't need prayer. I, I'm fine. I'm blessed. And so I was like, okay. Uh, I was like, well, like, and, you know, and we get to the destination because we we're already right there. And I was like, all right, I'm going to get out the car. I'm like, all right, Paul, well, I just want to let you know I'm praying for you. Oh, no, man, you don't got to pray for me, bro. I'm the last person that needs prayer. And I'm just like, oh, this is not going the way that I thought. <laughs> right? Well, I'm supposed to share the gospel with this guy. See, but that's okay, right? If you have been in that same boat and didn't get the response that you thought you would when trying to share the gospel, this is what we have to be reminded, church. We have to be reminded that when trying to share the gospel or even praying for somebody or even inviting somebody to church, we're planting seeds. We're planting seeds in people. And sometimes we won't even see these seeds grow. Maybe you're a product of somebody inviting you to church or sharing the gospel that you didn't come that first Sunday. Or maybe you came that first Sunday and you were like, man, they sing too much. Uh, they have us raise our hands. They did this thing. This, this guy's speaking. And yeah, I'm not going back. But later on, right, when something happened, you were reminded, man, God is just keeps, yeah, God, God is just there and he keeps reminding me. And then that seed starts to sprout. And then you start to see little leaves come out of that tree. And sometimes, right, we see that person five years down the road and they're a whole different person because I've seen that happen before. I've seen that happen before where seeds are planted and later on they grow. I mean, 
that's the reason that I'm here this morning, because of somebody inviting me to church and planting that seed, and later on it sprouted. And yes, there was moments where I felt like I was uh, doubtful of the things that God could do with me, but time and time and time again, God continued to show me just the plan that he had for me. So I was curious, right, when I was talking, to, uh, like thinking about how many people like the average or ordinary person comes in contact with on a daily basis. How many do y'all think, just some, how many do you think? The average person, or you, how many people do you think you come in contact on a daily pa- basis? Responses, 300? Okay, man, that's a little too much, all right? That you actually like talk to and come in contact with? 50, no, a little bit lower. 10, a little bit, 20, so 16, it's 16, all right, y'all there. The average or order, or unless you work in like customer service, right, you see people all the time, but the average or ordinary person comes into contact with about 16 different people, 16, right? And, and my wife and I were kind of counting the other day, like I was like, yeah, I talked to that, that person at QT, I, uh, there was somebody that came to us up at the mall and asked us for money, like those are people that, you know, we came in contact with. And you see, every day we encounter someone, whether it's people in our workspaces, people at school, or family. And some of us, even including myself, have given up on sharing the gospel or even inviting people to church who have never showed up once. But believe me when I say this, church. Believe me. I want everybody to look at me. Believe me when I say this. God has not given up on them. So why should we? God has not given up on your family member that you think would never come to Christ. God has not given up on that coworker that makes you mad every day. God has not given up on you who daily you sin. So why should we give up on those people? You see, being in ministry and being in the position that God has placed me in, it's easy for me to be like, yeah, I see youth on a day on a weekly basis, so I'm sharing the gospel with them. So I'm doing my Part. But that shouldn't be the mindset that I should have. It should be that not, I, I get it. You're not going to freak people out all the time and be like, hey, I just want to invite you to my church. Like, hey, come to my church, right? Hey, 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 uh, hey, you, like as people are walking. But as you're coming in, like, because there's people that you come in contact with that sometimes you're like, man, there's just something I feel like I got to tell them. Sometimes the spirit leads us in those times. And I'll be honest, most of the times when that has happened to me, I'm like, all right, I'm going to go you know what, they walked away. They're a little bit too far. So just next time, God. See, I want to give you now an example of what it means to share the gospel in the midst of conflict. So there's a, um, an author by the name of Elizabeth Elliot. I'm not sure if anybody has ever heard of her before. But this is her story. So she had a, a husband by the name of Jim Elliot, who was one of five missionaries who went to preach the gospel to the Akua Wadoni tribe in Ecuador. If I'm saying that wrong, forgive me. And they went to go share the gospel with these people. This is a tribe, an unreached people who they went to share the gospel with. And Jim was... uh, noting down daily like what was happening, the traction they were gaining. They were uh, going monthly or weekly or sometimes even staying there and staying with the tribe. Well, there was one day where all five of the men that were there were speared to death by the tribe. And so Elizabeth Elliot, Jim Elliot's wife, I know some of you may be thinking, man, she probably went to go get some revenge or she probably went to go get some justice because that's most of the times, that's what we think, right? Whenever somebody does something to somebody that we love or uh, hurts somebody that we love, we automatic th- automatically think about revenge or justice. But this is what she did. And this is uh, an article, or this is on her website. It says this, the resounding theme of Elliot's life was a boundless love of Jesus. And her greatest commission was to tell others of his saving grace. This costly call led her into the Amazon jungle of Ecuador, where her husband, Jim Elliott, was one of five missionaries speared to death in 1956, while attempting to make contact with members of the Akua Wadoni tribe 
Elizabeth, along with her young daughter, Valerie, would later return, get that, she would later return to the Akua territory to live among, and not only that, but minister to the people that killed her husband. Familiar with suffering, Elliot wrote, the deepest things that I have learned in my own life have come from the deepest suffering and out of the deepest waters and the hottest fires have come the deepest things I know about God. There are many stories of missionaries going across to share the gospel. And I'm not telling you that you have to go and lay down your lives just like Jim Elliot did. But it very, it very well could cost your life if you go. But that's the risk that we are taking for the calling that God has placed on our lives. And so I want to ask you, church, this question. Are you ready to share the gospel in the midst of conflict? Are you ready to go into your workspaces and share the gospel with your people? Are you ready to go into your schools and to be the light and salt of the earth as God has called us to be in your schools? Because it may very well cost your life. See, I have prayed this and, and I, I have said this in this way. I'm like, God, I give you all my life even if it costs my life. But very well, and, and I'm going to be honest with you. I, in my mind, I'm also like, all right, well, I don't, I don't want to leave yet, though. But, like, I mean, I'm just saying it, God. But I, I, I really believe that that's what the calling on has. Our life. Man, there's many. If you go online and just look up martyrs. These are people that have been killed for their faith. In, in, on Google, if you go look, there are countless of stories. Countless of stories. I wish we could sit here and talk about them all, but we can't. But that could very well be your story. See, I always remind the youth of this. I tell them all the time. And I look at them, right? I have some of them here. The, the youth are in here today. Um, I didn't have any youth the, this morning, but a lot of them are in here, and, and they can tell you this, I'm not lying, that I, I tell them all the time, I say, you are called. You are the next generation to be pastors of this, uh, of a church. You are the next generation to go and to serve in other churches. You're the next generation that is going to be called to go to the unreached people of this world. You are those people, but you, church, are also those people. And that is my call to you that maybe today is the day that you say, you know what, God? Yeah, I, I've been thinking about going overseas to go and share the gospel. Or man, God, I feel like you have, been stir you have been leading me up to be in some type of pastoral role or in some type of leadership role. Do you know that whenever God says, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, the disciples part is just not the leaders and the elders and, and those that are in the church, or sorry, the, the elders and the leaders in the church. But that's you that he's calling to go and make disciples. That's a calling that you have on your life, that God has called you to. And so I want to remind you that and, and, and remind you and ask yourself that question, am I ready to go and share the gospel? The answer should be yes, but how will God prepare us for that? Only he knows. Uh, 1 Thessalonians uh, chapter 2, verses 3 through 8 say this. For our appeal does not spring from error or impurity or any attempt to deceive, but just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak not to please man, but to please God who tests our hearts. So Paul is just saying, hey, we went to share the gospel regardless of what you were going to say or regardless of what anybody was going to say. We didn't go to please man, but we went to please God. For we never came with words of flattery, as you know, nor pre pretext for greed. God is witness. For we did not seek glory from people, whether from you or from others, though we could have made demands as apostles of Christ. But get this, but we were gentle among you, like a nursing mother taking care of her own children. So being affectionately desirous of you, we were ready to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own selves, because you had become very dear to us. Paul writes this 
in another, in Philippians chapter 1 through 23. He says, I am hard pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. See, the gospel, it's not just about sharing the gospel and going to share the gospel, but God also calls us to share our lives. If you were here for the XOXO series and you uh, noticed the theme was you sharing your lives and laying your down your lives for your brothers and sisters in Christ. See, uh, uh, a professor at the uh, Fort Worth Seminary, Dr. Carl Bradford, said this. Paul understood that ministry was about the people. Ministry was or is about the people. See, this is why we believe here at Waves of Faith, that relationships are our heart. That's one of our core values. Relationships are our heart. Because, why? Because we really love and care for you. Because we want you to join in the kingdom. It's not about us, but it's about God's people. And we're here, and we're ready to serve you. And again, as I mentioned, I'm a product of me sharing life with other people. My wife, Alondra, can tell you, whenever we first got married, she was all about hanging out with our brothers and sisters in Christ. And I was like, man, I don't like hanging out with them. Like, they always want to talk about God, and they always want to get in our business and ask how our marriage is, and we're fine. They don't need to know. But it wasn't even that. It was the fact that they were trying to share their lives with us so that they could help us. They could minister to us. Because they have gone through things that we were going through. And now my wife, Alondra, and I do the same with other couples or with other people. We share our lives with others. Our life is an open book. If you ask me anything about my life besides my passcode for my stuff and my pin for my card, like I'll share other things with you besides those things. Because we are called as believers to share our lives with our brothers and sisters in, sisters in Christ. See, Jesus says this in Mark 10, 45. Even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. See, Jesus Christ, our Savior, came to serve, not to be served, so that we, so we should take in that example that Jesus gives us and serve other people. And, and trust me, I know it's hard because our world surrounds us with, hey, it's all about you. It's all about your health and your wealth and your own being. And I'm not saying don't take care of yourself, right? But what I'm saying is that sometimes the call to ministry and missions or the call to follow God is costly. And God is going to ask for some of those dreams that you have, some of those things that you've been working up to, to lay those down before him and follow him. This is exactly what the disciples did. He told them two words, follow me, and they went. Now, there were some instances where God did say, hey, follow me. And some people were like, uh, you can look in the Bible and the Gospels. One person was like, oh, I don't know, let me go. I got, I got to bury my dad before I come follow you. Or, hey, I got to go and uh, um, or he, God, God asked one of them, Jesus asked one of them, hey, go and sell your riches and then follow me. And he's like, he walked away and never came back. The call to ministry and to follow God is costly, but it is possible. And Jesus Christ showed us that as the example. Philippians 2, 5 through 7 says this, Have this mind among yourself, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was not in the form of God, so, so though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with, equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself. By taking the form of a servant. See, God, think about this. God is, he's the God of the universe. He could have came demanding everything and having people bow before him at the sound. I mean, he created everything in this world, but he didn't do that. He came to show the people that he was about the people and that he really cared for them. And so, church, I ask you the second question. This is a call for you to share your lives with your brothers and sisters in Christ. Are you ready to share your life with others? Not only that, but are you ready to serve others? Are you ready to serve others? And again, I mentioned I'm here today because there are many who share not only the gospel, but their life with me. And now I have lifelong friendships because God put it on their heart to share their life with me and to serve me in many ways. Many of you may not believe that God can use you, but believe me when I tell you this, church, Again, all eyes on me. Believe me when I tell you this. 
that there, even though you may not believe that God can use you, there's somebody in here that, you, that is your brother and sister in Christ that believes in you and believes in the work that God can do in you. They are, trust me, I, I don't know how, but it happened every time whenever I was about to get into some kind of uh, mess that I had men texting me like, hey, what are you doing, bro? Hey, how's it going? I have, I have messages and I can still go back. It was mainly on Messenger because I didn't really give my phone number out. Uh, but I can go back where people were asking me, hey, how are you doing? How's life? And I remember sending them long messages because in that moment, I was going through a hard time. And I hope that one day you'll get a message from me asking you how you're doing when you're about to go do something you probably shouldn't be doing, right? Hopefully that happens. Or maybe when you're about to do something that you might regret. We're gonna continue in um, 2 Thessalonians uh, verse nine. It says here, for you remember brothers that our labor and our toil, we worked night and day that we might not be burden, a burden to any of you while we proclaim to you the gospel of God. You are our witnesses and God also. How holy and righteous and blameless was our conduct toward you, and toward you believers. For you know how like a father with his children, we exhorted each one of you and encouraged you and charged you to walk in a manner worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. So there goes Paul again reminding, he's earlier he said that they were very dear to him like a nursing mother and now he says like a father with his children. And so he says that we exhorted you, each one of you, and encouraged you and charged you to walk in a manner worthy of of God, And that is my call to you, church. And I want to also encourage you, as Paul encouraged the church of Thessalonica, to walk in a manner worthy of God by loving him and loving his people as you love yourself. That is the greatest commandment that God has given. They asked Jesus, what is the greatest commandment? He says, love God, love people. Say it with me, love God. Love people. Loving God, you're obeying his commands and all that he has. But then the second thing, he says, love people. He says, love people. And that is my call to you. See, church, again, as I mentioned, we are here because we love you and we want to get to know you. And we want to build relationships with you so that you don't have to feel like you're alone today. And we want to encourage you with all that we do. See, the last thing Paul says here in verse 13, and he says, we all, and we also thank God constantly for this, that when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it. It is not the word of man, but as what it really is, the word of God, which is at work in you believers. And here's the last thing that I want to share with you. And the last thing, are you ready to be saved? Are you ready to be saved? Yes, yes. And some of you have already been saved. Or maybe some of you have been on the verge of being saved. And God has been pressing on your heart and calling you to him. See, God, Jesus Christ, the story of Jesus Christ never changes, right? He came and died for you. Jesus was the plan from the very beginning. We can see it in Genesis when we read and see the prophecies of Jesus Christ, that he was the plan to come and, and, to come and save you, that he died and was buried. But guess what? He defeated death and was resurrected on the third day. And that's what we celebrate, that we are able to come and join in that family. And check this out. He didn't only die for believers, but he died for all those that will not believe in him. For everybody, everybody. And maybe today, maybe today that is you. Maybe he's calling you today. See, I mentioned earlier, the story of Jesus Christ, it never changes. But guess what it does do? It changes lives. His story changes lives. And so I want to ask at this time, See, usually at, at times like these, we close our eyes and we ask people to stand up. But I, I, want, I want the lights to be the brightest that they can and whoever's back there. I think this is the brightest that it can be. And I want to ask you, church, for those of you in here, maybe you felt a call today that you, 
feel like, man, maybe I've been struggling in my walk with Christ and I just need to reconnect. I, I need a prayer. I want to ask that you get up at this moment. Or maybe you felt a call to missions or ministry. And maybe God is calling you to go somewhere and you need prayer for that. I want to ask that you stand up right now. It's okay. Don't be afraid. If you, if you don't feel like standing up, thank you. And here's the thing. Maybe God is calling you to himself. Maybe you've never given your life to him. And today is the day. Why wait for tomorrow? Hebrews 13, 8 says this. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. The story is not going to change. His calling is going to be there. But it is up to you whether you accept it or not. And so I want to ask at this time, if you feel God calling you to him, I want to ask that you stand right now. And here's what I want to ask for those of you that are around the people that you see standing. I want to ask that you, everybody stand up and, and surround these people. And we're going to pray for them. See, whatever that calling that God has called them to, I want to ask that we pray just for who they are. Uh, for those of you, if you want to raise your hand if you were one of those standing so that people know where to go. Raise your hand if you were one of those standing so that people know where to go. Raise your hand. Raise your hand up high so we can see. See, God is going to fulfill the purpose that he has in your life. And, I, and, and all you have to do is believe and trust him. Yes, it's going to be hard. Yes, if he is calling you to a position of leadership or ministry or if he's calling you to go across the world to share the gospel, there's going to be some trials along the way. But guess what? God is going to get the glory in all of it. Father, we come before you and we thank you, Lord, for this moment that you have provided, Lord, this moment that you planned, Father. And God, we thank you for each and every person that is in here, Lord, that has either been called to give their life to you, Lord, has been called to go and be a, a, a pastor or some type of elder or something in a leadership role, or those that are just want to reconnect with you, God. I ask that you be with them, Lord, and we thank you for who, their lives. God, you get all the glory in all of this, Lord. We come as brothers and sisters in Christ, sharing, Lord, and wanting to serve each other, Lord, wanting to love your people, God. If we have a hard time today uh, loving your people, God, I ask that you break down those walls, you break down that pride in our lives, Father, and we go and we love your people just as you love us. And God, most importantly, we exalt you for who you are, and we thank you. We thank you, Lord, that you gave your son to die for us. And I pray that we remember that all the days of our lives and we teach that to every person that we encounter, Lord, if it is your will. Lord, we thank you. It is in your son, Jesus Christ's name that I pray. Amen. Amen. Give it up for